Hey guys, this is Jay from Three Rivers Outdoors, and we're back on our six acre slice of heaven here in Western Pennsylvania. And today, we're gonna talk about what's right behind me, which are a pair of Dunstan chestnut trees that we got from GardenGoodsDirect.com. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history of the American chestnut, um, why it's important, uh, what happened to it, and maybe a little bit about how to revive it. And um, we're gonna talk about what we're gonna do with these on our property. So if you stay tuned, I'm gonna give you a little background and then uh, we're gonna unbox these guys um, and uh, show you exactly what, uh, what came in the mail and what, we, what our 189 bucks got us. And we're talking today about the history of the American chestnut. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of information um, on these trees and why they're important. You know, because before the turn of the century, the American chestnut was the dominant tree species in the Eastern United States, primarily because it could grow extremely rapidly and attain very large sizes. The tree was often an outstanding visual uh, feature in both urban and rural landscapes. Many trees grew as high as 100 feet tall with some of these American chestnut trees growing up to 150 feet tall. And amazingly, many of them uh, have been found to have trunks of 16 feet in diameter, uh, which is obviously very, very large. In colonial America, these trees were very important because they were the preferred species for log cabins, especially the bottom rot prone foundation logs that needed to stay solid. Later, um, posts and poles, as well as flooring, and even railroad ties were all made from chestnut lumber. <clears throat> With nearly 4 billion of these trees on the East Coast, this tree was very hardy, very plentiful, easy to work with, and extremely useful to colonial Americans. Lumber made from the chestnut heartwood actually needs no pressure treatment before being put into service and doesn't leach any toxic compounds into the soil, so they're really ideal for use. The edible nuts were a significant contributor to the rural economy in early America. Hogs and cattle were often fed these nuts and fattened up, allowing them uh, as well to, to just be able to forage in the forest floor for these chestnuts. Chestnut ripening also coincided around Thanksgiving and Christmas, the holiday season, and newspaper articles at the turn of the century in the late 1800s often showed railroad cars overflowing with chestnuts rolling into American cities to be roasted and sold. Chestnuts were such a staple of American life that uh, they were even part of our Christmas songs like chestnuts roasting on an open fire. This was a hallmark of the American Christmas season for hundreds of years. These trees produced a massive amount of food which fell to the ground so much that you could actually shovel up chestnuts. Everything from deer, bear to wildcats ate the chestnuts that fell from these trees. Even ground plants like mushrooms bloomed and flourished in these tall forest environments that were rich with chestnut, uh, chestnuts that fell to the ground. With chestnuts as the backbone of this ecosystem, many of the early American colonists used the, um, and, and fed from the animals like deer as well as um, bear and uh, other wildlife that ate these chestnuts. So this was a really important food staple even as it treed up the food chain to the early colonists. All this began to change, however, in 1904 when a disease was accidentally introduced into North America from imported Asiatic chestnut trees. The chestnut blight was first noticed in the Bronx Zoo in New York in 1904 by the chief forester there named Herman Merkel. Um, the introduction of the chestnut parasite reduced the position of the American chestnut tree which was 25% of the American forest to little more than just a small shrub that would show up here and there. Once affected, these chestnut trees would produce millions of spores which would infect the neighbor trees. Um, the spores were carried in the wind on the wings of birds um, by insects and uh, it would transfer to distant forests. 
The blight raced so much across the Appalachian Range that people estimated that about 50 um, miles per year were killed by this blight. Um, in 1910, severe worry really started to set in. Uh, farmers were actually implored to chop down chestnut trees when they saw them at the first sign of blight. And even the Boy Scouts um, would scour the forest looking for the American chestnuts and, and take these blight-stricken trees and chop them down and burn them. In fact, here in Pennsylvania, we tried to create a quarantine zone on the western half of the state where we are to no avail. Um, there hasn't been really effectively any chestnut lumber sold in the United States for several decades. And the bulk of the annual chestnuts that are sold um, in, in, as a food crop or at, you know, in the grocery stores are really coming from imported chestnuts uh, from overseas Europe and Asia. However, in, 19, in the 1950s, next door to us in Pennsylvania and Ohio, James Carpenter of Salem, Ohio, discovered a large living chestnut grove of dead and some dying trees. Um, and he was a member of the American Nut Growers Association. He was pretty impressed that he did end up finding a tree with no evidence of blight or infection and did his best to even try to inoculate the tree with um, active spores of the blight and mycelia and the tree didn't show any infection. So he sent some budwood to Robert Dunstan, another Nut Growers Association member, and he was a plant breeder in Greensboro, North Carolina, hence the name the Dunstan Chestnut. He grafted these chestnut rootstocks into some trees and they ended up growing pretty well. And then he managed to cross pollinate uh, these uh, chestnuts with Chinese chestnut selection um, called the Kuling the Mayling and the Nanking. In 1962, seedlings from these trees first began to bear some fruit. They selected the individual trees with the best hybrid characteristics and then crossed them back to both the American chestnut and Chinese chestnuts. So the resulting second generation of chestnuts now have been growing for about 50 years and the hybrid trees have grown well throughout the eastern United States and almost none have ever died from blight. These Dunstan chestnuts are really, really an important uh, recovery story in, uh, in the eastern seaboard of America. They produce yearly crops of very large, sweet tasting nuts, whereas the Chinese nut versions are much, much smaller. The Dunstan chestnuts average 15 to 35 nuts per pound, whereas the chestnut from the Asian trees can range in the uh, 50 to 75 nuts uh, per pound. So we got a nice box today via FedEx from GardenGoodsDirect.com. And the uh, box is pretty heavy. We have two of the Dunstan chestnuts here in this box. We're gonna show you what it looks like. My handy Leatherman. Cut our tape. Let's open this guy up. America's number one online garden center. So this is what comes in the box. You've got two trees. Um, they are positioned opposite of each other so that um, uh, the leaves aren't getting entangled. <clears throat> They're strapped down pretty nicely. They come in a pot. Um, soil seems to be well, um, well watered. They're nice and damp. We're gonna cut these open and show you what you get. So guys, what you get, depending on the size you order, you get two wonderful six foot tall Dunstan chestnut trees. You can see the tag here, Chestnut Hill Outdoors. It's got a email and a phone number. It shows you that maintenance is easy. They like full sun. They get 40 to 60 feet, 
with a spread of 30 to 40. Planted least true trees together. They bloom in May. It bears fruit after three to five years. They like well-drained soil with lower than seven pH. Pruning may be necessary. Water on a regular basis as needed. There's that hardiness zone, five to nine. <clears throat> they do come with a, uh, a bamboo stick, as you can see here, just to kind of give them stability in the, um, in the packaging. And it gives you some instructions here as to how to plant it. Backfill, water thoroughly, nothing unusual there. These are really hardy trees. I mean, you can see the leaves are all intact. <clears throat> There's one little dead one right here. But uh, everything is very strong. The, the leaves themselves are hardy. Um, exceptionally, exceptionally, they're, they're like thick. You, they almost feel like leather. And uh, in fact, this tree has little Looks like some, some growth there on the top. Let's see about this one. Yeah, that one looks as if it was trimmed. But these are very good, um, very good quality trees. <clears throat> I'm actually really pleased. Uh, I bought some trees and shrubs by mail before, um, but I will tell you, I think these are top notch. Cannot wait to get these things in the ground. Um, and uh, we're gonna put them in a wonderful spot that uh, we'll get good sunlight, we're gonna give them a ton of water, and we're gonna watch these guys grow. So, thanks for tuning in to Three Rivers Outdoors as we uh, opened up our Dunstan chestnut trees. I'm super excited to plant these, and I cannot wait to share some saplings with my neighbors, and I hope that you'll do the same and continue to support um, repopulation of the American chestnut, or the Dunstan chestnut now, um, around your area. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I'll put a link um, to a few things that we use on Amazon to help these things grow. Um, but thanks again for watching Three Rivers Outdoors. It was a pleasure doing this video with you.